Welcome to Highgrove this morning. I'm Deborah, this is Ed, and we want to welcome you to our service this morning. Um, we are live streaming on our website, on Facebook Live, and on YouTube. We'd love it if you could leave us a message, uh, send us a comment, say hi to one another, uh, send us a cheeky joke if you like. Um, but we'd also love to welcome you, especially if you are with us for the first time. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Why don't you send us a a message on Facebook Messenger or, um, or send us an email at highgrove, uh, hello at highgrove.church. Um, and uh, we've got a packed service this morning. There's lots going on. And uh, thanks so much for being here. We're gradually getting used to this. So we're getting there. Um, we're going to, in a few minutes time, we're going to have uh, some sung worship together. Um, it was really great last week to see pictures of people getting involved in the worship in their living rooms and doing some actions and singing. And it's fantastic. It might seem a bit of a strange thing doing it in front of a screen. But, but um, you know, let's, let's get involved. Let's do that. So that's going to be in a few minutes time. Um, yeah, so such an important uh, time for us to be praying at the moment uh, as a church. There's so much going on in the world and it's prayer that is going to make the difference. And so we're going to be giving some time this morning as part of our service and also pointing to other opportunities where we can be praying together as a congregation. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, and also there's going to be various sort of activities and sort of fun stuff going on for all ages and for family groups and things. And so we'll hear a bit more about that. And then we've got Jamie Davies, who will be uh, doing the next part of our, our series this morning as we just dig again into the Bible and see what it is that God wants to say to us. There'll be an opportunity again for for prayer ministry to receive prayer this morning, if that's what you'd uh, you'd like. But um, I don't know about you, you know, there's kind of lots of stuff changing every day. It just feels like, you know, every time I open my computer or watch the news, there's kind of a new bit of something to get to grips with, a change to sort of try and live out, something to get our heads around, sort of perhaps fresh limitations or different ways of living. And it can be really, really challenging. I hope you're, you're doing OK with that. Yeah, but I found that there's actually some positive things. There's been some pleasant surprises. I've been pleasantly surprised uh, by doing PE with Joe this week. Uh, Toby and I uh, did our PE lesson um, live streamed on Facebook um, with uh, with PE on with Joe. And um, yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by how much my muscles ached the next day, especially given the time target audience of, of mainly primary school children that it was aimed at. Now I'd just like to say really sorry at this point that I didn't manage to capture that on video so we haven't got that footage for you this morning. I am relieved, I am relieved. Um, but why don't you uh, let us know if there's anything that you are have been pleasantly surprised, anything that you have been uh, encouraged by this week, things that you have found that have uh, blessed you. So why don't you put a comment on, our, uh, on, on the Facebook Live uh, stream or on YouTube just so that we can all encourage one another. So just before I hand over to Annie and Matt, let's just take a chance to pray together at the start of our worship. Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, so much for your, the love that you pour into our lives. And Lord, as we come to you now to worship, Lord, we give our lives to you again. Lord, we recognise your greatness. We recognise your power. We recognise your authority in this world. And Lord, we, we pray as we come to worship, help us to remember that we have a firm foundation in you that our hope is secure, that we can know uh, what it is to, to be close to you, to be with you. And we worship you now. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning from Madden, Annie and Barnaby. We're going to sing some songs together now. Um, some of them have actions, which means we're going to use our bodies as well as our voices to worship God yes. and to thank him for the amazing promises that he's made us. Um, so the first song yeah. is All Through History. Start with Noah. Noah built the most enormous boat. We kept the birds and animals afloat. The Lord was good. The Lord was strong in Noah. Moses. Moses led his people through the sea, taking them away from slavery. The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and Moses lived his life for him. Thank you. Oh, thank you, oh, thank you, that all through 
Shepherd boy became a king. The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and David lived his life for him. Now, Daniel the lion. Daniel was inside the lion's den, but God brought him to safety once again. The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and Daniel lived his life for him. on good days and on Daddy. bad days and we can trust that your plans are good for us. Amen. Amen. We've got one more song together now. Yeah. It's called Good Good Father, reminding us yes, of exactly the same, that God is a good father who yes, loves yes, his children. Read the book. Okay, we're going to read it later, okay? We're going to sing one more song first. Here we go. Wow. 
Through your son Jesus, you want to give us that peace that is inexplainable. And we pray, Lord God, for everybody around us, for people that are close to you, for people that are far from you, that they would know that peace in their heart that only comes from you. Thank you for your perfect love that casts out all fear. Yes. Amen. 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 Well, thanks, uh, Barnaby and Annie and Matt. Counting for Jesus, that's what we like to see. Um, it's great to worship together, isn't it? And uh, we're going to take a chance now to pray. So I'm going to hand over to the Richardson family as they lead us in that. At this time of online messaging, Zoom, WhatsApp and Facebook Live, it's all enabling us to socially distant. But prayer does the opposite, bringing us closer to God, into his presence and able to know his love and care for us. Just take a few seconds to recognise God with us, his spirit in us and Jesus near us. We'll start by thinking about the different countries of the world, all affected by the virus. As you see the countries on the globe, pray for them. God of love and hope, you made the world and care for all creation but the world feels strange right now. The news is full of stories about coronavirus. Some people are worried that they might get ill. Others are anxious for their family and friends. Be with them and help them to find peace. We pray for the doctors, nurses and scientists and all who are working to discover the right medicines to help those who are ill. Thank you that even in these anxious times, you are with us. Help us to put our trust in you and keep us safe. Amen. Abby will now do a prayer for those who are not feeling well. Dear Jesus, we pray for those who are feeling unwell, that they might get better from the virus and get the help they need. Amen. When we were doing our bedtime Bible this week, we found that this verse from 1 Corinthians was a good prayer for us all, as we spend a lot of time with a few people. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love doesn't boast or envy. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love doesn't insist on its own way. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love rejoices not in wrongdoing, but in truth, justice and forgiveness. And a prayer of blessing to finish. Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to love our neighbour, to care for those in need as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick and to assure the isolated of our love and your love for your name's sake. Amen. Thanks, guys. We're going to take just a, a moment now um, to pray just where we are, um, whether that's uh, by yourself or with, um, with, your, uh, with the people in your household. 
but we um, have prayed for the impact of the coronavirus. We've prayed for all the people involved. We pray for researchers and medics on the front line who are trying to treat and to find cures. But we also want to pray for a supernatural breakthrough um, by God in halting the virus. So why don't we, uh, why don't we just take a moment now to pray for that supernatural breakthrough, that's intercede, that God will break in and halt the spread of the virus. Father God, you are mighty, you are all powerful, and we cry out to you, will you stop the spread of the virus? And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to take a, a chance to pray as a congregation this evening as well. So six o'clock this evening on Zoom, um, we're going to gather together to continue to pray. Uh, if you've never used Zoom before, then the, the first thing you need to do is either on your uh, your, your laptop, your computer, go to uh, this website address here, zoom.us, and uh, download the uh, the Zoom client, the, the program on your computer, or, or go to the app store on your, your phone and download the app there. Um, and on an email that we're going to send around just after the service today, there's going to be a link to uh, to that. Uh, and you just click on that link and then you'll be able to join that meeting. And we would love to see you uh, in that meeting. You know, you can be on there, you know, with your camera on so we can see you. Actually, if you just want to sort of, you know, log in and, and kind of listen in to what's going on. Um, actually, you're very, very welcome. Just just come and join us this afternoon. Uh, well, this evening, six o'clock. Let's hand over to Joe, our children's pastor. Hello everyone, really nice to be with you today. I'm sorry I'm not wearing my children's church t-shirt but today is a purple day um, because this week we have been thinking about the story of Noah and the rainbow. Um, so I wanted to talk about that story a bit more this morning as well. Now I went to try and find some boats so that we could play this but all my boats are at church. So yes, it is a Vroomster from Go Jetters. This is Noah's Ark, and it's going in our water here. You're not going to be able to see until I lift it up, so you wait a second. So I've been thinking about a lot about Noah. Noah. And Noah must have been really lonely in his boat. Yes, he had his family with him, and he had lots of animals, but he was all by himself. And in that boat... In that water, let's see, oh, there we go. It must have felt like a really long time that Noah was waiting. A really, really long time. But him waiting in that boat for a really, really long time wasn't the end of the story. And God was with him in that boat. And he is with us now too. God made a promise when the waters went down and the boat hit dry land, that he would never flood the earth again. And we can hold on to that promise today. And the big word for today is hope. We can hope in that promise. And hope isn't a wishy-washy feeling of, oh, I hope so. It's knowing that God keeps his promises. Um, I just wanted to read a little bit from the Jesus Storybook Bible, which we were looking at all last time in in King's Kids, as it was then. And it talks about the stories of the Old Testament, but it brings Jesus back into them. And in everything, we need to bring Jesus back in. So it's a bit of the story at the end of Noah. And it says, And there, in the clouds, just where the storm meets the sun, was a beautiful bow made of light. It was a new beginning in God's world. Now, it wasn't long before everything went wrong again, but God wasn't surprised. He knew this would happen. 
That's why, before the beginning of time, he had another plan, a better plan. A plan not to destroy the world, but to rescue it. A plan to one day send his own son, the rescuer. God's strong anger against hate and sadness and death would come down once more, but not on his people or his world. No, God's war bow was not pointing down at his people, it was pointing up into the heart of heaven. And as we head towards Easter in these strange, strange times, it's important that we look to Jesus. What a great story about Noah and his family stuck in isolation, just like we are too. So in a minute, we're going to hear from Jamie, who's going to be sharing from the Bible. But we thought some of you guys might like to have an activity to do this morning. So this morning, we're going to be making some rainbows. So you might have seen um, around your neighbourhoods that people have been putting rainbows in their windows as a sign of hope. In fact, all around the world, people have been doing this um, as a sign of hope. So go and grab any creative materials you have. It could be colouring pencils or pens or paint. I've even seen some knitted ones. Go get creative and then we can put them in our windows for everyone to see. I made one yesterday. I did it with watercolour. Um, but we'd love it if you guys were to take a photo of you and your rainbow before you put it in the window and put it in the comment section or stick it on Facebook or Instagram and tag us as a church so the whole church can see your beautiful rainbows. And then please do put it in your windows as a sign of hope to everyone today. We really look forward to seeing them. Okay, and so now we're going to continue our Sunday series called Kingdom Come, and we're going to take a chance to open our Bibles together. I'm going to hand over to Jamie, who's going to, uh, to, to lead us through that. Um, but I'm going to pray for us first. Lord, thank you so much that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Lord, we want to listen to you now. We want to take on board what it is you have to say to us. And Lord, we want to be people who live it out mm. in our lives. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, folks. I hope you're well. Um, this is a new experience for me. I've, uh, I've never preached to myself on my own before uh, to a video, but um, I've had quite a few new experiences this week. I've been working from home. I've been doing a lot of uh, teaching via video, um, a lot of meetings via video conference, um, all sorts of quick learning curves on technology and all that kind of thing. I'm sure many of you have had the same sort of week. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm uh, getting a little fed up of video calls and video conferencing. I, I much prefer being um, being with people and hopefully it won't be too long until we're back together again. But um, for now, I think it's, it's really important that we continue to gather as a church family, even if it's in this strange virtual way. And it's important that we gather around the words of Jesus and hear what he has to say to us. And um, if you think this is a little strange for you, think about what it's going to be like for me as uh, right now I'm sitting in my lounge watching myself on TV preaching to myself, uh, which I'm sure is a very strange experience. So hello, future Jamie, and um, I hope you're blessed by my message. <laughs> um, let's jump in, shall we? We're continuing our series called Kingdom Come, looking at selections from Matthew's Gospel. And today we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew 24. So you might find it helpful to have your Bibles open at that passage, um, but it should hopefully uh, appear on your screen too, and you'll have the text there. Of course, when uh, the series and the list of passages was finalised weeks ago, um, none of us really had any idea what was coming our way and how much our lives were going to change. So when I picked this passage, Matthew 24 and 25, which is often called the little apocalypse, I had no idea that I'd be preaching it from quarantine at a time of national crisis. It's a pretty hard passage to preach on at the best of times, let alone in the middle of a situation like this. But I really felt that I, I shouldn't run away from it. And I actually felt that it's perhaps just the right passage for us today. So Matthew 24 and the, and the similar stories that we find in Mark and in Luke is often read as something of a prophecy of the end times and um, concerning itself with the second coming of Jesus. I won't go into the details, but um, this, I think, is a, a bit of a misunderstanding of this text. For a few reasons, I don't think it's some kind of coded prediction of how the world will end. In order to read it properly, and um, what I think is faithfully, we're going to have to do a little bit of, of history work and understand a little bit about the first century. But once we grasp what it said to the disciples of Jesus in the first century, I hope we'll see a little bit more clearly what it says to us and still says to us in the 21st century 
and especially at times of difficulty like this. This final sermon by Jesus is sometimes called the Olivet Discourse because it was delivered on the Mount of Olives, a hill just outside Jerusalem. It was a a beautiful place, a place of, of great significance for the Jewish people. Listen to what the prophet Zechariah said generations earlier, speaking of a coming day of the Lord. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name the only name. This uh, prophecy captures the heart of the Jewish hope, a hope for the kingdom of God. A day when Israel's God would come to defeat the enemies of his people and become king over the whole earth. And when that day came, the Mount of Olives is where he would begin. Jesus, of course, began his ministry by proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand. And Zechariah's prophecy would have still echoed in the air when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives and taught his disciples for the final time. Jesus was fulfilling an ancient promise that God would come to his people and that he would deliver them from their enemies and that he would be their king. So, I don't think Jesus is really talking here about a future second coming from heaven to earth, but about his first coming to Jerusalem, his royal entry to the city and his enthronement as king in fulfilment of Zechariah's prophecy. God would come and be king. Though, of course, none of this was going to happen in the way anyone expected, for this king would be raised up on a cross not on a throne, and his crown would be made not of gold, but of thorns. As well as his coming to Jerusalem, in this final sermon, Jesus is also talking about the chaotic aftermath of those events for that generation. Their present age would indeed end, in a sense, when he came to Jerusalem to take its evils upon himself on the cross. But when he rose from the dead, the hoped for age to come would be launched and his reign would begin. The kingdom of God was at hand. Let's read the passage together. We don't have uh, that much time and we're not going to read the whole two chapters. So we'll just look at a few highlights, beginning with the first couple of verses of chapter 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. In the chapter before this one, in chapter 23, Jesus has just delivered a scathing sermon against the religious leaders in the temple. He'd finished by lamenting that Jerusalem had not been willing to listen to him and had resisted him when he wanted to gather them in lovingly like a hen gathers its chicks. It's a really emotional chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And now, as he's leaving the temple court with his disciples, they call his attention to the splendid temple buildings behind them. Mark and Luke's versions of this story mention how impressed the disciples are with the size and the beauty of the stones. For some Jews, the Jerusalem temple was a matter of huge national pride. The glorious first temple built by Solomon had been destroyed, of course, by the Babylonians in 586 BC, and the people had been taken into exile. When they returned to rebuild generations later, their national resources were so low that the second temple had to be smaller and less impressive than Solomon's. And at first, it was a bit of a disappointment for some. We read in the book of Ezra how some of those who had seen the glory of Solomon's temple wept aloud when they saw the foundations of the replacement. But nevertheless, it stood, and it stood for 500 years. And after decades of expensive renovation and expansion by King Herod, at Jesus' time, the temple buildings now shone on the hill as though carved from solid gold. And this must have seemed to the disciples to be the most impressive and stable thing in the whole world. 
In the turbulent days of first century Judea, this 500 year old building and what it represented was something that they could depend on. So it must have been quite upsetting for the disciples to hear Jesus's response when they pointed the building out. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. This is a prophecy of earth shattering significance for the disciples. And I mean that quite literally. For a Jew at that time, the temple was not just a religious building, but the very meeting place of heaven and earth. Like the burning bush or Jacob's ladder or the wilderness tabernacle after which the temple was modelled. The temple was a place where heaven touched earth. It was not just a building. It was a place where they could meet with God. And this, Jesus tells them, will soon come crashing down. Jesus' promise that all this would happen within a generation came true in AD 70, when at the height of the first Jewish war, the temple in Jerusalem was burned and destroyed swiftly and violently by the Romans. To make matters worse, as the Roman general Titus marched on, marched on the city with his army, false prophets rose up and misled the people. In one case, we're told that the huge brass gates swung open all on their own. And this was interpreted by these prophets as a sign that God was opening a door of happiness for his people. What it was doing, of course, was letting their enemies in. Other false prophets encouraged the people to climb to the top of the temple and, and there await deliverance from God. And there they perished along with the building. It's an understatement to say that the world was an uncertain place for God's people at that time. In a matter of months, there was widespread confusion, war, famine, earthquakes, false teaching, persecution, a sudden invasion, and the collapse ultimately of the very thing that seemed the most stable in their world, the heart of their worshipping lives and the focal point of the universe. And the temple came crashing down. What would they hold on to when that time came? Let's um, leave that sad story and go back earlier, 40 years, to where we left Jesus and his disciples, walking away from the newly finished temple and heading for the Mount of Olives. Jesus sees that this tragedy is coming and he takes this last opportunity to teach his disciples. I want to highlight just briefly three messages of hope that he left for his disciples to remember when the tough days came, and which I think can offer us hope too in our own uncertain times. Let's pick up his sermon again in verse three. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumours of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of birth pains. I've already talked about the serious problem of the false prophets, but did you catch those last two words? birth pains. Not all pain is the same, of course. There's a pain that leads to nothing, which seems pointless and that almost makes it worse. But sometimes there's pain that leads to joy, to new life. When Jesus describes the troubles that are coming, he describes them as birth pains. You see, Jesus knows that no matter what happens to the kingdoms of this world, whether they go to war or descend into famine, a greater kingdom is being born in the midst of it all, the kingdom of God. It's not that these things won't hurt, of course they will, as anyone who's given birth will tell you, but they will also tell you that the pain of childbirth is nothing compared to the joy that lies on the other side. 
Jesus wants to leave his disciples with a new perspective, the perspective that comes from seeing their pain, not as meaningless suffering, but the birth pangs of the kingdom of God. When earthly kingdoms are shaken, as they still are, especially right now, disciples of Jesus remember that in the middle, in the middle of this pain, an unshakable kingdom is being born. I'm not going to dwell on it too much because there's also already been enough sadness in this sermon. But after this, Jesus describes all sorts of trouble and distress that would accompany those days. His disciples will be arrested, sometimes executed. There will be people displaced and others deceived. It's going to be hard for everyone, especially the vulnerable. As he often did, Jesus finishes this section with another lesson from nature. Look at verse 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I'm looking out my window right now and I can see uh, that the, the twigs of the trees are starting to have little buds on them. Um, the tree doesn't seem to know that everything in our lives has ground to a halt and yet spring is still springing and summer is near. Why was Jesus worrying his disciples with prophecies of a coming persecution? Surely what they needed now was some kind of sign of life, some kind of encouraging word, something to help them keep calm and carry on. Maybe you're wishing I'd do the same in my sermon this morning. But here's the thing. When these terrible things happened, they would remember what Jesus had said and how he had told them that this was coming. In the unpredictable chaos of those days, they would know a powerful truth. None of this was a surprise to Jesus. The sure things of the world would be shaken, but nothing shakes the Lord Almighty. He's not unprepared or caught off guard. This was true for them and it's true for us. At the time, no doubt, Jesus's predictions were confusing and scary for his disciples. But once the calamities came, there was a strange confidence that came from knowing that their Lord saw this coming. It didn't make going through it easy, of course, but it gave them assurance that even in times of great upheaval, Jesus was king. And then he's not a king that is caught unawares or unprepared. So we've looked at the birth pains and how that image reminds us that in the middle of pain, the kingdom of God is being born. And we've looked at the fig tree and how that image reminds us that even if we are caught off guard by the things that come our way, God is not. And so we come to the third and last thing I want to look at this morning. In verse 34, Jesus finishes his story about the fig tree by giving them an important promise. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The temple, the place where heaven and earth met, would fall within a generation. And when that happened, remembering what Jesus had taught them would not only give assurance to his disciples, it would give them a new fixed point in a shifting world. By the time the stones of the temple had fallen, they would know that they had a better stone, a perfect cornerstone that could never be thrown down. And they would build their world on this stone, on Jesus and his words on the one in whom we really do see heaven touching earth. And this is the great news. The same is true for us. Maybe we're feeling shaken and worried about the basic foundations of our lives right now. The things we used to take for granted. Will we be safe and healthy? Will there be food in the shop when I get there? Will I still have a job at the end of all this? Will the economy survive? I realise that for many people in the world, those are daily questions. 
And I'm very lucky that I haven't to ask questions like that very much until quite recently. But to be honest, at times over the last few weeks, I've begun to feel like nothing can be taken for granted anymore. As if all the things that I thought were solid and dependable in my life were shaken and crumbling. And at times like these, we all need to remember that despite what the world might tell you, there really is only one sure and stable thing worth building your life on. And of course, it's not a thing, it's a person. Jesus and his words. At times like this, we all need to hear this promise from Jesus again and again. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that your words are the truth, that you are dependable, that you are the solid rock on which we can uh, build our lives. I just want to pray now for anybody who's feeling particularly uh, shaken, anybody who's feeling particularly insecure uh, at this moment. I pray, Father God, that you will come, that you will, uh, that you will send your peace that you will fill uh, each of us with your spirit now. We look to you. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you, our solid rock. Amen. Amen. Um, and in a minute, we're going to head back into a time of worship. But what we want to do is offer anybody who would like to an opportunity to receive prayer uh, this morning. Um, we're going to do that remotely. So this, here's how that's going to work. If you would really appreciate someone uh, praying for you this morning, we've got a, a prayer ministry team standing by. And if you text or WhatsApp your name to uh, to this number here, what will happen is one of the uh, the prayer ministry team will give you a call and they'll just take a chance in just a really relaxed way to, to pray for you over the phone. Uh, they'll be available until 12 noon today. Um, and so actually, as we head back into worship now, why not take a chance to uh, to drop a line through and to ask for prayer? Great. We just got a couple more songs together. So we're going to sing Cornerstone together now.
he shall come. When he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Father, stand before the throne. We look forward to that day. We shall stand before Him. Oh, oh. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. eternity and we look forward to that day when you will be all in all. Amen. Right guys we've got one last song together and I'm gonna ask the fan back in Yeah. because we did try and involve Barnaby in the uh, tender worship moment but he grabbed the camera and the stands and you know everybody and everything really but so we're gonna, gonna need a little bit. Play. We're going to sing Plans, which is one of Barnaby's favourite songs, isn't it, Barnes? You're going to sing Plans? You're going to sing Plans? And then we're going to sing again and everything in the world. Okay, well, that's fine. You might see Barnaby at some point during this video. Here we go. Uh, in clear G, I think. Yeah. Yes. Promises you've spoken. You've got plans to give us a future and a hope. We are not forgotten, we are not alone. Plans to lead us home into your heart. You are always with us every very hour. You stay loyal for a lifetime in the shadows and the sun. Our worries overtake us. We believe that they will break us. You've got plans to give us a future and hope. We are not forgotten. We are not alone. Plans to lead us home into your heart. You are always with us. Every very hour. We are not alone. Plans to lead us home into your heart. You are always with us. Everywhere we are, plans to lead us you and a hope. We are always We are not alone. Plans to lead us home into your heart. You are always with us. Everywhere we are. Shining down upon us, never letting up. Oh. 
<laughs> bit of a funny ending there. Because <laughs> Barnaby was attacking the camera. But it's true. God has got plans to give us a future and a hope. That's what we turn to, that's what we believe, that's what we declare over our families, over our nation, over this world, today and the rest of this week and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we're just about to uh, come into land, but just a quick reminder about our prayer gathering later on, six o'clock on Zoom. That's for all of the Highgrove family. Uh, we would love it if you joined us uh, for that. Do join in later on, six o'clock on Zoom. But we thought we'd uh, leave you with a couple of questions that you might want to ponder uh, coming out of um, Jamie's talk. We just thought uh, maybe you would like to talk about them with your families over lunch today. Maybe uh, discuss them with your small group on Zoom or just sending uh, messages to one another. So um, we thought that we would ask you to think about one thing um, that you thought was solid was dependable, that's actually been shaken up by the coronavirus pandemic. What have you missed most this week? And secondly, what is something that Jesus has said in the Bible that you can hold on to right now? You might want to uh, get creative and write these down or um, put them up somewhere in your house. You might want to um, draw them or, or even paint them on some stones as that sign of that firm foundation uh, that Jesus' words are to, to us for the week ahead. But uh, it's been great to have you with us. It's been great for us to gather together. We've looked for, we, we've uh, really enjoyed being with you. Thanks for, for being with us. See you later. See you.